What is going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Uh, in this one, we're actually going to take a look at efficient net, uh, rethinking model scaling for convolutional neural networks. And I think this is one of those papers that you've all probably heard of. Um, and to be honest, it's not too difficult, I would say. The the idea of the paper is pretty pretty simple actually. So what we will do is we will take a look at the paper. Uh, the paper also uses tricks from a bunch of other papers. So in the end, I will uh, explain those tricks. And uh, yeah, so you will have a pretty decent understanding of efficient net. And then if you also want to take the, the next level, uh, the next step, uh, in the next video, I think I'm going to implement this uh, from scratch as well. So be on the lookout for that if you want to really understand uh, this model. So, all right. So let's just go through the paper uh, and read it as you would, and I'll take out the parts that I that thought would be pretty interesting. So anyways, in the abstract, uh, in this paper, we systematically study model scaling and identify that carefully balancing the network depth, the width, and the resolution can lead to better performance. So uh, that those three things, right, the network depth, right, the number of layers, so how deep the network is, the width, which means the number of channels, and then the resolution, so the input image size, right, those are the three sort of things they are interested in in this paper. So they, they don't introduce a new architecture like ResNet that introduces this, this novel uh, skip connection idea. Rather, they take some baseline net I don't want to get ahead of myself. I always get ahead of myself. So let's just read through the paper. But those are the three things that they're interested in. So we propose a new scaling method that uniformly scales all dimensions uh, of depth with resolutions using a simple yet highly effective compound uh, coefficient. All right, and then if we go down, in particular, uh, efficient at B0, it sees state of the art on ImageNet while being smaller and faster which is pretty cool. And then you can also see on this graph right here, obviously um, it increases as you increase the model. So you have efficient at B0, that's sort of the baseline. And then if you um, make it larger to efficient at B B7 um, with more high, more parameters of the model, you obviously increase the, the accuracy. And you can see that this achieves much better accuracy while having a ton less parameters than, than these right here. Um, all right, so the process of scaling up comnets have never really been understood. Uh, the most common way to scale up comnets by their depth is by their depth. So, you know, uh, you've probably encountered this as well. You, you're just going to build your own uh, convolutional neural network on some some data set of your, that you're interested in, and you know the how to build it and how to scale it and all that stuff. It becomes really, really difficult, and so. Um, this paper will hopefully give you better intuitions on how you how you want to do that. Um, so the most common is to scale up by their depth, right? Just make it more layers. Another less common but increasingly um, uh, popular method is to scale up models by image resolution. So most common, you know, ImageNet models use 224 by 224. That's what we, we're all used to. But uh, one other common is to make it larger. So I think Inception V3, I think, used 299 by 299. And yeah, so making just having more pixels to work with also increases the, the accuracy of the model. Uh, yeah, so in previous work, it is common to scale only one of those. And then arbitrarily, uh, scaling requires tedious manual tuning, and it often yields suboptimal accuracy and efficiency. And yeah, in this study, they found that it is critical to balance with depth resolution, and such balance can be achieved by a simple scale uh, by simply scaling each of them with a constant ratio. All right, so here we can see some different stuff, right? You can increase, you can make it wider, more channels. You can make it deeper, more layers. You can change the input resolution of the image, and here is their proposition of of you doing all of the three in a very specific uh, way. So what did we say over here? Yeah, our method uniformly scales network width and depth and resolution with a fixed uh, set of fixed scaling coefficients. For example, if we want to use two raised to the n times more computational resources, then we can simply increase the network depth by alpha raised to n, width by beta raised to n, and image size by gamma raised to n, where alpha, beta, and gamma are constant coefficients determined by a small grid search on the original small model. All right, so this could be a bit confusing. So uh, 
these alpha, beta, and gamma parameter are what they come up with. And we'll take a look at um, later on in the paper, they mention exactly what they found those to be. But what's pretty nice about them is, is that if you raise them to a power, then uh, it will the computational cost of the model will be raised with two raised to that power that you raised the constant values with. So I guess in this way, it's sort of nice to know that, all right, um, if we have sort of a, a budget uh, of how computationally expensive we want the model to be, then uh, we can do so exactly um, which is a ni nice thing as well about this uh, that they propose this uh, compound scaling method. All right, so intuitively the compound scaling method, and we'll get to exactly how that how that looks like later on. Uh, it makes sense because if the input image is better is bigger, <laughs> then the network needs more layers to increase the receptive field and more channels to capture more fine grain patterns on the bigger image. Yeah, so that doesn't really say much, right? If you if you increase the number the depth then you have more comb layers stacked, and then you have a larger receptive field, meaning you can get more high-level features of the image and so on. But then obviously, uh, if you have, yeah, if, and also if you have more channels, you can capture more uh, complex patterns. All right, so uh, we are the first empirically quantified the relationship among all three dimensions of network width, depth, and resolution. Uh, and I don't think this is very important, so we'll just move on. All right, so model scaling. Uh, there are many ways to scale a ComNet. So ResNet, for example, can be scaled down, right? ResNet 18, that means that you have eight layers. Uh, ResNet 200, um, yes, yeah, so you can adjust the network depth, the number of layers, uh, while wide ResNet and mobile nets can be scaled by network width, so number of channels. It is also well recognized that bigger input image size will help accuracy with the overhead of more flops. In this section, we will formulate the scaling problem, study different approaches, and propose our new scaling method. So uh, here, I'm going to skip this part, but this is, so what they do here is that they, they define a comnet layer and uh, sort of um, how, do you, how do you define a comnet. The only thing that's really important uh, that we're going to take a look at is the, this fi is an operator, so that's sort of the com layer that works on some input image. All right, so if we go up here uh, and continue, um, unlike regular ComNet designs that mostly focus on finding the best layer architecture FI. So, you know, most most networks like ResNets, for example, they focus on introducing a new idea to the architecture, like the skip connection and all of these things, like Inception, for example, using, um, you know, doing all of these different kernel sizes at the same time, concatenating them in a nice way, and and so on, those are focused on the network, the architecture, and the, the ComNet layers, the operators FI. Model scaling tries to expand the network length, width, and or resolution, the height and the width of the image, without changing FI predefined in the baseline network. By fixing FI, model scaling simplifies the design problem. So what they do is that they just take some baseline network, you can take whatever network, and then they want to see, okay, how should we scale this network? That's sort of, so, so it's a bit different from other architectures in that way. So, but it still remains a large design space to explore different, uh, you know, L, uh, I guess that's the length, right? Yeah, the number of channels, the height and the width, right? Obviously, um, it's still a pretty massive project to, to find those. But in order to further reduce the design space, we restrict that all layers must be scaled uniformly with constant ratio. So that's a way to, to simplify it. Yeah, so scale, uh, So conventional methods mostly scale comnet in one of these dimensions. And we've already talked a bit about this, but the depth, right, the number of layers, the width, um, and, or the resolution, right? So if you increase the, the depth, you can form a uh, I guess, yeah, you have a larger receptive field, you can find more high-level features of the image, uh, but then you run into problems like vanishing gradients, but that can be solved with skip connections and batch norm, blah, blah. You, you I think you got that part uh, from previous, but yeah. And then the width, obviously, you can find more complex patterns. And then the resolution, you have a higher uh, pixel, more pixels to work with, you can find more, you have more information to work with, essentially. And the, the key point here is that if you just increase all of them, you'll have better performance, right? So if you here they increase the, the width, um, 
you you get better perform better accuracy if you increase the depth you get better accuracy if you increase the the resolution of the input image you also get better accuracy so the observation is that scaling up any dimension of network with depth or resolution improves accuracy uh, but the accuracy gain diminishes for bigger models as we saw it sort of plateaus after a while uh, and then we empirically observe that different scaling dimensions are not independent. Correspondingly, we should also increase network width when resolution is higher in order to capture more fine-grained patterns with more pixels and high-resolution images. These intuitions suggest that we need to coordinate and balance different scaling dimensions rather than conventional single-dimension scaling. And I think this all makes sense, right? They're, they're not independent. Uh, if you increase the number of layers, you might want to also play around with the depth uh, and then also the input resolution, and and, and they, they talk a little bit more about that by showing these um, the, why they came up to that conclusion. But I think that's a very intuitive idea, and I think we don't need to go into more depth. It, it, it makes sense that they should be um, dependent upon each other. So the observation is that in order to pursue better accuracy and efficiency, it is critical to balance all the dimensions of network with depth and resolution. All right, so I feel this is kind of a Honestly, it's kind of a verbose paper in this way. I think they could have made it a lot more compact, uh, but yeah. Anyway, in this paper, we propose a new compound scaling method, which uses a compound coefficient phi to uniformly scale uh, with network de with depth and resolution in a principal way. So the depth is some constant alpha raised to phi. The width is some constant value beta raised to phi. The resolution is some constant value gamma raised to phi and then they so this is an optimization problem that they introduce such that they have some constraints on the on on the values and why they do that is specifically so that if you uh, in, if you change this uh this phi you um you increase the computational cost of that model by a fixed ratio uh and i think they'll, they'll talk about that just in a moment but these alpha, beta, and gamma are constants that can be determined by a small grid search. Intuitively, phi is a user-specified coefficient that controls how many more resources are available for model scaling. Alpha, beta, and gamma specify how to assign these extra resources to the different parameters of width, depth, and resolution. So the new phi, the to if, if you, you specify the phi, so the total flops will in approximately increase by 2 raised to phi, which is extremely convenient if you have um, a fixed computational budget, if you're deploying on, on mobile or something like that, and you want to fix uh, to a specific flop that, that's available. All right, so, um, yeah, since model scaling does not change layer operators in a baseline, having a good baseline network is also critical, uh, right? So if you take AlexNet and you play around with the depth and the width and the resolution, it's it's not going to compare to to uh, ResNets or something like that, right? So the architecture also matters, uh, and that makes sense. So, anyways, here is the EfficientNet B0 baseline network, and specifically, um, they use MBCOM, so that's uh, inverted res residual block, which comes from the mobile net uh, paper, and we're going to take a look at that um, a, a little bit. But let's for now, let's just imagine that. It looks, it looks like that. That's the baseline network that they work with. Uh, its main building block is mobile inverted bottleneck, MBCOMV, uh, to which we also add squeeze and excitation optimization. So they, they use that baseline. Then they also introduce some, some, some trick from another paper, squeeze and excite, excitation paper. Um, and ideally, you know, you would want to take a look at exactly how those papers look. But we're also going to, I'm going to explain it uh, in a more intuitive manner, I guess, um, just briefly how this looks like and works. But we'll we'll get back to that in a moment. So the steps is that to fix this phi to 1, and then we do a small grid search for alpha, beta, and gamma. And then in particular, they find that the best values are alpha 1.2, beta 1.1, and gamma 1.15 under that constraint. Step two is that they then fix those constants and scale up the baseline with different phi um, using equation three. So equation three, yeah. So those you, you just specify the depth based on those con constant values and you just increase phi, um, which again would be probably more dependent on your specific uh, computational budget. 
Uh, notably, it is possible to achieve even better performance by searching for alpha, beta, and gamma directly around the large model. So what they do now for computational reasons, reasons is that they look just at the small model and then they assume that those values will also extend to a larger model. All right. So all they introduce here are sort of the, the results that they get uh, and they get pretty good results. And then you might have a question, which is, well, how do we know that it's not just the architecture that they introduced that gave these amazing results? And so to, to show that it's actually about this ratio that they find, they also take older models like ResNet, DenseNet. Uh, I think they also look at Inception, MobileNet, a bunch of different models. And they saw that this idea generalizes to all of these. And, and in that way, obviously, um, the key point is that the ratios uh, of how you scale it actually matters. Here are some other details on the implementation. So uh, they use uh, Silu, I think that, that's how you pronounce it. Um, they use auto augment for data augmentation. You can probably use rand augment as well. Uh, they use stochastic depth. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what stochastic depth is because that's another one of those tricks that they use. So auto augment is just for data augmentation but they use stochastic depth with survival probability of 0.8. And then they linearly increase dropout from a uh, ratio from 0.2 to 0.5 for, for the large. So they increase the dropout for larger models. Yeah, so they want some intuition of why it works better or does it work better is essentially the question. So they have some image, they look at the activation map for the baseline model, and then they look at it for compound scaling. And this looks a little bit better, so the model is probably better. And then you have this circular thing right here. You can see the baseline activation map. And then you can see the activation map with compound scaling, which looks better. So it's probably a better model. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I guess that makes sense. You can read through the discussion and all that stuff. But I want to go back because I think what's important uh, for when we're going to implement this to understand is, first of all, how does these inverted residual blocks work? And again, you would probably go to um, go to MobileNet paper, MobileNet V2 paper, and read that if you want the exact details. Um, but let's take a look at that first, and then we'll take a look at this squeeze and excitation, that, that another trick that they use. And then lastly, the trick about uh, stochastic depth. All right, so those are the three tri tricks that they use in their baseline architecture. All right, so here is the kind of the uh, an image showing the... the um, mobile inverted residual uh, block. So essentially you have some input, right? You use a one by one comp and you expand the number of channels, right? You can see that the number of channels here has increased. Um, and, and you do that, so if we go back to the paper again, and you do that expansion, all right, and then you do that expansion specifically by this value here, this uh, yellow value. So here's the expansion um, the first one is one and then it's six and then the kernel size is there. But anyways, so if we go back now, it's a little bit might have confused you there. But anyways, so the, the input, you do a one by one comp, you expand it by a specific ratio of one or six. What you do then is something called a depth wise convolution. All right. So if you normally use a three by three comp, you use a three by three across the height and the width, and you also do it across the channels. Uh, for a depth-wise convolution, you you do a three by three kernel, but you do it for each channel independently, right? You can see that here. Uh, normally, this right here would be a cube uh, of three by three by three, but since uh, it's a depth-wise convolution, um, it only does it for each channel independently. All right. Uh, then uh, here they use ReLU six. They use Silu uh, instead in the efficient net paper. Then they use another one by one conf, again, adjusting the number of uh, of channels to match the original one. So they kind of expand it, use a depth wise, uh, and then they go do a one by one again to get back the number of channels. So this is nothing from sort of this paper. This is from uh, mobile v 2 And then they also lastly use a skip connection right there. All right. So that's the sort of baseline, but then they use some other tricks. So in, specifically in between here, so in between those steps, they use this, uh, let's see, squeeze, squeeze excitation. And you might be like, well, what is squeeze excitation? 
I'm glad you asked. So we're going to take a look at that one. So squeeze excitation. Sorry for the bad image here. But anyways, so squeeze excitation works that you have some input, right? First of all, it goes through some com layers. You get some, some output from those com layers. And that one has some specific number of channels and some height and some width, right? So what you do then is that you you first uh, do an, uh, an adaptive pooling across the height and the width. So specifically, uh, each channel will, um, all the height and the width values of pixel values will get just the average pool to a single value, all right? So if we originally, and excuse my drawing here, but if we, oh my God, that's bad. Oh God, like that. All right, so if we have this channel right here, like that, this channel, that will become just a single value, right? So that's a single channel value now. Uh, and so it goes through an average pool. And then what happens is that um, it, it, uh, it goes through a one by one conv. Uh, so it, it basically, so what it does then is that it, it, all of these channels, right? So originally it might be, I don't know, it might be height times width times some number of channels. After it goes through the uh, average pooling, it will be one by one by C, right? Then it will go through some one by one uh, sort of uh, com layers to compute some some uh, some new values for these uh, for each channel, and then lastly it will go through some sigmoid. All right. So the values at the end here, like this channel right here, the red one, it's going to be a value between zero and one. And that's going to be the case for each of these channels. So specifically what happens is that we take the original one, then we element-wise multiply them uh, with the value that has gone through for these this squeeze and excitation uh, part, um, which has gone through the sigmoid. So specifically, it's sort of like a it's sort of like an attention model where uh, the question is, well, how much should we prioritize each channel? Or rather, which channels should we prioritize? Perhaps there are more, some channels that hold more valuable information than others. Um, so th that's the idea. Maybe this original one gets multiplied by uh, by 0 0.1. So we want to, I guess, pay attention to 10% of, of that information. Um, not exactly like that, but that's sort of the idea. And so you can imagine that this is very cheap. We're just using a one by one conv, which is incredibly cheap. And yeah, so that paper showed that this almost always helps with the accuracy. Again, if you want the details, you'll probably understand better when we go through the implementation. Um, or if you want to also read the, the paper, squeeze and excitation paper, you can do that. It's gonna be in the description. All right, so we've gone to th uh, two of the tricks that they use. Specifically, they use uh, the inverted residual block and then the squeeze and excitation. Then they also use a stochastic depth. So let's go through that one as well. So the, the stochastic depth is that, so imagine you have some example, right? You have one image. Uh, it goes through some, some blocks, right? And in this case, what this is, this in the middle, is exactly that that inverted residual block that we just looked at, right? So it goes through the, that block, and then it has some skip connection, um, exactly as the as a residual block, and then randomly, um, randomly some are just disappear, right? Some are gone here and here, and so what's only passed here is the residual connection. But then for another mini batch, there are some other ones missing. Um, or for some other example, there are some other ones missing. And then for some other ones, there are some other ones missing. So the idea here is that randomly uh, some layers are gone and it sort of um, works, I guess, similar to dropout, except that we're dropping layers instead. And the only information that's passed is these residual connections. So those are the, the three sort of tricks uh, that they use. Uh, and then they are, have some other information here, like the base number of channels, uh, the number of layers that they do that specific um, inverted residual block for, and so on. So here it's a three by three kernel. Um, here it's a five by five. Yeah. And so uh, this is the baseline network that's efficient at B0. 
And then what they sort of focus on is how should we increase the number of channels here? How should we increase the number of layers here for each of these stages, right? These nine stages. And how should we increase this input resolution? And then they do that by those specific ratios that we took a look at. But I thought it would be interesting to also know some more information about how the baseline network works. All right, so I think you now have a decent understanding at least uh, of EfficientNet. And in the next video, uh, probably the next video, we're gonna implement this from, from scratch in PyTorch. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, stick around for that video. And I just wanna say thank you so much for watching this video. Like the video if you thought it was interesting and subscribe, that really helps the channel. All right, I hope to see you in the next video.